Last Sunday, we shared how across our three campuses at Life Center, uh, this year compared to last, we're ministering to 600 more people on a weekly basis. And so we announced that, uh, that we're gonna add an additional service in September and how you can help. So one of the ways if you come to this service that you can help is, you know, just probably about like 50 more of you go to the first service. I know that's a sacrifice to get up early, uh, but it'll keep both of them full, but not dangerously over capacity. But I also want to share something that I find actually breathtaking, which is that just from July, 160, over 160 people, kids, students, and adults have said yes to follow Jesus just this year. Yeah. And we are used to seeing people say yes to follow Jesus, but, but maybe not at this scale. And so uh, following Jesus can start with a decision, but we pray it leads to lifelong discipleship, which means you and I become more like Jesus together. It's really all it means. And it's an extraordinary work of the Holy Spirit. And we give the Holy Spirit all the credit and glory for what it is that he is doing. And so one of the ways that we want to steward this well is at Palm Sunday, we're going to be putting in all the seat back and there'll be a digital one for those of you online, this little like follow Jesus card. And this is not a card you give to us. This is a card that anybody can take. And on it, it just has the, a link to a website that we've created with the first four steps that you need to take in terms of how you follow Jesus. And so whether it's your friends, your family, your coworkers, it's also a site for you who are Christ followers who were inviting people who then begin to follow Jesus, you may not know where to begin. This is where you can start. And we can walk alongside of you and see people not only say yes to follow Jesus, but then begin to root in Christ and grow in Christ. And so you can do that. Of course, if you say yes to follow Jesus, we have a free Bible for you. Um, we also have a Bible reading community called HeartStrong Monday to Thursday that you can join. It's online and you don't have to read. You don't only have to read the scriptures alone and be lost in a little bit of the hithers and the dithers. You can ask questions and you can grow in following Christ uh, because we are dedicated to one thing, and that is you becoming more like Jesus. That's what it's all about. Uh, the ch this church will be judged not by our size. It'll be by the quality of disciples that we produce. That's it. And so that's the bullseye on our target. And in terms of discipleship, last week we were talking about faith, and we sort of turned the soil of it. And this week, we're asking the Holy Spirit to pull out some weeds some weeds that can begin to grow in our garden of following Jesus or our garden of faith. You know, how many of you here, just by a show of hands, have a, a mobile phone in your pocket, a smartphone? Can I see your hands, please? Okay. Um, I just want you to know that that thing is instant. And it's great. There's some actually really neat tools uh, that you can access on that. And there's some wonderful apps. So I, I'm not trying to dismiss that. I, I'm just saying... How quick that phone moves is antithesis to how your faith grows. Okay, we have an instant society and we have a garden faith that is about planting and watering and weeding and growing. And, and, and these are, are, are different. And, and here, here, here's why that is so critical. It's because the more we're formed by tech, instant technology, the more frustrated we become in following Jesus because it feels really slow. And nowhere is this slowness, slowness, I should say, more evident than when you're in a crisis. And so why are patience and prayer forever linked together is a question we want to answer. And when I think about faith, I don't go to statements of faith. I go to Jesus. I look to Jesus. And I'm going to imperfectly talk about this tension today. I know that. I'll make mistakes. I know that. But I want to try to live in the tension of a couple of different things. And one would be almost like a fanaticism when we talk about faith that denies reality. That would be one extreme. But the other would be something called fatalism, which is also not faith. There are some of you who just go like, hey, sirrah, sirrah, whatever's going to be, whatever's going to be, God's going to do whatever God's got to do. It doesn't involve me at all. He's sovereign. He's all those things. And he is. But then why should I pray? Well, I'm just, it's okay, sirrah, sirrah. This is not the posture of faith either. Delusion, denial of reality, or fatalism. This is not what biblical faith is. When we look at Jesus, we see a rhythm. 
You can look at Jesus everywhere, but if I honed us in right this moment in a garden called Gethsemane, we see Jesus do something really, really powerful. He is just about to be crucified. So that is right in front of him, literally right before him. And we see that in prayer, he asks his father, if there is any other way, can you take this cup from me? which is pretty remarkable because the whole way through, he knows precisely who he is and why he's here. But when the crucible of the moment, he prays, God, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. But then he trusts and he says, but not my will, yours be done. And so there's this rhythm that we see in the life of Jesus. And here's what it looks like. God, you are able because you are all powerful. God, you are able I don't know what you're gonna do in this situation, but I trust that you're good. And we don't see it for the very first time in Jesus. You can actually see it if you go all the way in the book, in the Old Testament, you see it in three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king says, commands, you gotta bow to this idol. And they say, no. And the rhythm of their no, the rhythm of their faith is God is able to deliver us because he is deliverer. I don't know if he will, but we're still not going to bow. That's the rhythm of faith. God, you can don't know what you're going to do or not going to do. But I'm going to trust that you are who you say you are. And this is not easy, church. There are millions of people right now who will not open their heart to God because they don't believe he is good because of how bad this world is. God, if you are good, why this? And you will go through circumstances and seasons in your life where the outcome will not sync up with the promise. And in that place, it will become a place of deepening faith and of worship, or it will become a faith where you wander. Here's what James says. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. So be patient until you're with the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Be patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. And then it says three words, establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another. Turn the person beside you and say, that's for you. Don't grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door as an example of suffering and patience. Did you see the two words that go together? As an example of suffering and patience. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. Steadfast in what? In suffering and patience. In God, you can. God, I don't know why. But Lord, I've established my heart that you're good. James says faith. It's like a wave. And you know what's interesting about a wave? You can play in a wave you can surf a wave. Um, you can stay out of the waves if you don't like it. Like, but you know what a wave is? A wave is just the ocean. It's all it is. But a wave is affected by the tide and the winds. And it creates this thing called a wave. But the wave is nothing. It's the same ocean, but it creates this thing. And so James says, that's what faith is like. It's affected by things around it. It's affected by people, by life, by circumstances, that it's going to be affected by all of these things. And the one thing when you're in a storm is it's choppy waters. It's very easy to trust God in the stillness. It's really difficult to trust him in the storm. And in the storm, we can misunderstand like the disciples did when they looked at Jesus asleep and they said, do you not care? But when one lives with the authority that Jesus does, he is always at rest everywhere because 
God, you are able. I stand in the authority of who I am, even when I see and don't see, and I trust that you're good. And so he's at rest. He knows that's not his time. That's not how he's going to go. And so a core understanding of our faith is following Jesus. It holds all these things in tension that all is not right in the world. And everyone said, like, you don't, you don't need to be a rocket scientist. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, on this we agree, all is not right in the world. But the Bible says in a world where everything is not right, God sees our afflictions, he knows our sufferings, and that he is with us, that the work of the cross is finished, but he is still at work where one day he will make all things new. So we are living between the finished work of the cross, but not the final work of God. And we are living in this tension where one day, yes, there will be no more tension with, when we're with the Lord, but right now, now we live in the tension that God you are always with us and you are equally high above us in other words God you are with me whatever it is that I'm going through and what I want you to do and seemingly what you are doing seem at odds in a way that I can't reconcile sometimes and so I am to stand in faith and I'm also to worship by faith with the things sometimes that I celebrate like the answered prayer and sometimes in the unanswered prayer is also a place of profound worship that I engage. The psalmist in 103 says, for as, as the heavens are high above the earth, so, is, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear and worship him. And then Isaiah said in 55, chapter 55, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so God is with us, but he's higher. And, and Jesus said on earth that there was an individual named John who was the greatest, like demonstrated the greatest faith and this John was in prison and was about to literally lose his head because he spoke up about marriage in his culture, by the way. But he was going to lose his head. And um, it's quite fascinating because while in prison, he is about to lose his head. And Jesus said he's the greatest. And you know what happens to John's faith in this place? God, I am asking you. I don't know what you're going to do, but I trust that you're good. When John is here between asking Jesus and wondering what Jesus is going to do, Jesus essentially says to John, if you read the story, because John says, are you the one or should I expect somebody else? In the midst of the storm, in the midst of the crisis, the baby who leapt in Elizabeth's womb doubts that Jesus is who he said he is. Why? Because Jesus is not gonna rescue him from prison or death. And he says, are you the one? Like, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. When the Messiah shows up, this shouldn't be happening. It's our time to take over. And Jesus says, yeah, we are. We're just gonna do it in a way that you can't imagine. Are you the one or should we look for another? And Jesus said, he's the greatest. And this happens to him. And so faith in the crucible is contending and asking. But in the place between wondering, does it lead you to worship or does it lead you to wander? That's the pivotal question of faith. And this is what the book of James is all about, by the way, loved ones. Which is why it's paired beautifully with Proverbs in the Old Testament. You know the key heart of the book of James is wisdom? Do you know when you need wisdom? when it's not A or B. Do not steal. No wisdom needed. <laughs> Honestly, we can complicate it by putting all of these situational ethics around it, but it's pretty clear what he's saying. Don't steal. Don't take what's not yours. You don't need wisdom. You just need obedience or disobedience. That's it. Like you're gonna surrender and submit to that rule or you're gonna go, no, nah, I'm above it. It's obedience or disobedience. It's not unclear. But you know where you need wisdom? Do I date this person or this person? Do I take this job or that job? Lord, how are you at work in this situation? God, how are you good when this keeps happening to me? How are you provider when at the end of the month, there's always more month than money? God, how, how do I do this? 
Well, what do we do, God, when we prayed every prayer and we did it right and they still died? God, what do, we, what do I do when I was faithful and my spouse was unfaithful? What, 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 what do I do? You know what you need there? The book of James says, now you need wisdom. And it says you need wisdom from above. Because loved ones, there is a lot of faux wisdom all around you that appears deep, but it's anchored to death. Be careful of it. It will lead you nowhere but into disillusionment. How do you grow in wisdom? Well, the, the best picture that James has is like the trades, like the ma- a master and an apprentice. This is the type of picture of patience and prayer and faith that we read in James. Like, so the apprentice says, be patient. And the master says, until the coming of the Lord. Like until we're with the Lord, you don't have to be patient. And let me just throw this in. This is a freebie. Uh, you never have to pray for patience, Ever. Like, just get in a relationship with any human being and you'll grow in it. I'm serious, right? Well, does it matter which one? Not really. Not really. Just get into a relationship with anybody and you'll grow in patience. In particular, Leaf fans, they're really, you got a lot of patience with them. Just be patient, be patient. And, and, and be kind as well. I'll throw that in there. But being patient, though, like, Let me also say, like until the coming of the Lord is this trust in the God who will one day make all things new. And all things new is not healing. It's not restoration. It's, it's, It's what happened to you will be made new as though it was never broken in the first place. It is a remarkable promise in terms of what God is gonna do. We want God to heal. Like if, if our relationship is healed, I'll never forget what you did to me and you'll never forget what I did to you, but it can be healed, it can be reconciled. That's not the same as something being made brand new, a fresh start, a new beginning, old things passed away, it's brand new. This is the promise. This is the final work of God. We're living between the finished and the final, so there's tension. And here's where the Hebrews writer writes it this way. Being patient is not only about outcomes. It, 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 is, it is an invitation to a deeper place. Women received back the dead by resurrection. And then it says, so women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release. So they were given a choice, renounce Christ or die. And they said, no, I won't renounce Christ. So they might rise again, the Hebrew writer says, to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn into, they were killed with the sword, and they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, simply because they bore the name Christ follower. And then Hebrew says, of whom the world was not worthy of them. Wandering abouts in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Wow. I hate suffering. And I love how the Bible never shies away from it. There is a false faith in the church today that claims faith, but is rooted in fear. The undergirding of it is fear. Don't, 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 don't. It's all fear. It's fear that masquerades masquerades as faith. True faith is not a denial of reality, nor though is it living in fatalism. True faith, like we see in Jesus, asks boldly of the Father, reminds the Father of his promises, stands and contends wholehearted for the very things that God promised on earth as it is in heaven. This is faith. And then sometimes, like Hebrew said, when we receive what we but we can't see what was promised and we receive the opposite. God, I know that you are sovereign, that you are good, that you are able, that you have all things under control. And I don't understand this. It is in this contested place that can lead you to a deeper, not a better, a deeper faith where you worship 
in spite of your circumstance, not just because of it. It takes great faith to believe God for miracles, church, and I never want to dampen that. It takes great faith to believe God for provision. It takes great faith to believe God for salvation. It takes great faith, and it takes us exercising our faith for provision, for freedom, for deliverance, for salvation, on and on. Every promise, it takes faith, and we should exercise our faith in all of them. It it takes great faith to believe God for all these things, and trusting God takes a deepening faith, especially when life is profoundly unfair. And just in case some of you have any mischaracterizations about who God is, let me remind you of what it says in these scriptures. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and he will not fulfill it? And also the glory of Israel in 1 Samuel And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should regret. Malachi 3.6 says, for I, the Lord, do not change. We need to change. God doesn't. You cannot improve upon perfection. For the Lord does not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Titus 1.2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Hebrews 6.18, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled for refuge may have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And James 1, 7, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation, there is no shadow due to change. When he says he is good, it is pure goodness. It is why when we're unholy, we need to be made holy because we can't comprehend this level of good. So God never uses deception. He never lies. He is trustworthy all the time. And sometimes the outcomes will not be good. In life, we won't always see what we desire to see. But loved ones, we are Christ followers, which means that this life is also not the sum total of all that life is. Every human being that breathes in air is an eternal person. That is why you cannot judge the totality of who God is based upon earth. You have to see it from an eternal perspective. This is just a vapor, no matter how short one's life is or how long one's life is, the Bible describes it all the same. It is but a vapor, it is fleeting, it is powerful, but it is momentary. And here's how I would articulate it. If we limit our faith only to what we see, it is like you or I trying to define or describe the whole world by only where you live. Like, I live in Orleans. Is it beautiful? Sure. (laughs) But are there more beautiful places in the earth than Orleans? Yes. (laughs) Some of you are like, oh, oh yeah. Like the Mare Bulabog, it's something. Everest, a little better. Yes? Uh, Petrie Island, not, not, not bad. Uh, if you're new to Canada, don't ever go in it. Okay, don't ever go in it. Not unless you want to befriend bacteria. Otherwise, stay out. So there's Petrie Island. It's a body of water. It, it, it's, it's nothing like standing in front of the ocean. So, so all I'm saying, though, is if somebody were to ask me, describe what the world is, and I only gave them Orlean's perspective, I would be true that this is what the world is, but I would be completely lost that this is not what the world is. So when you're going through something, you are going to be tempted to define God by what you're going through. That is the same thing as saying this is what the world, if it's foolish to do that, then it's foolish to do this. We get, God gets to define who he is, not us. N.T. Wright says it this way. To be hasty to live with an impatient spirit is another form of pride, of the human arrogance that imagines it knows better than God. And so being this kind of patient is a wisdom that we all need to learn to be in Christ. And we're learning to be this kind of patient, this kind of wise in Christ. And as we're doing it, can I just say this? Two things left. One is this, and I really mean this with pastoral clarity, affection, and correction. There's a statement you will never hear come out of my mouth 
in particular when somebody is going through a storm. This outcome is because you didn't have enough faith. Number one, I'll never say that because I think it's one of the most unloving things. And some people who do say like, well, yeah, but Jesus said it. Yeah, then let Jesus say it. Because he has a different perspective than you and I. I think it's terribly uncharitable to say to somebody in the midst of the storm, if you would have had more faith, why? Because I don't know the measure of faith and I also sometimes, as high as his way is, I don't think it's good, but I trust that he's working something good. This is me trying to play God, which always ends poorly. Hey church, let's just let God be God. You know what's something better to say to somebody when they're in the midst of the storm? I'm with you. I'm with you. What can I do? What can I bear? How can I pray? Can I bring a meal? Can I listen? And here I think the scriptures in the book of James gives us something really powerful to do. Is anyone among you suffering? This is what he says. Okay? Is anyone suffering? Is anyone going through a hardship? Is anybody? God, you are able. I don't know why. And I'm learning to trust that you're good. Suffering. Is anyone among you suffering? Let them what? Let them pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let them sing. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church. Watch what it says when those with spiritual maturity show up. It says they pray over them and they anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that we show up with a ton of advice why this is or isn't. It just says, my job isn't to figure this out. It is to carry you to Jesus. It is to help you not look at the waves but look at the one who is in authority over the waves. And sometimes when life has a profoundly unfair outcome, my job is to walk alongside of you where in one day I don't add harm to your pain. That I can walk with you by patience and prayer so that you can see Jesus once the storm begins to clear a little bit. And the prayer of faith will save the one, redeem the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed to sins, he will be forgiven. All I know is the road of suffering and sickness is the most vulnerable journey where Christians can become stuck and lost, disillusioned and wounded by well-meaning Christians, I'm not judging your character, who believe they're saying helpful things, but they end up saying harmful things that cloud how people follow Jesus. And so for James, becoming lost looks like one wandering from the truth. And that's what it's all about, loved ones. God, I trust that you're able. I'm unsure about this. And now I have two roads. Worship or I wander. And James says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings them back. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death. Do you hear what he said? It's sobering, church. Like wandering, he doesn't say, it, it, there's no harm in wandering. He says, no, no, wandering can actually you can wander to a place where your soul experiences death, separation from God. And will cover a multitude of sins. Here's what I've found in my 25 years of pastoral ministry to be particularly unhelpful in trying to bring anyone back to follow Jesus who's wandering from the faith. I don't find shame works. Uh, I don't, shame will get you compliance, it won't get you transformation. I don't think criticism works. I don't think any versions of you're not doing it right over and over work. And I don't think fault finding works. Um, but here, here, here's what I've seen works. 
if by God's grace you can meet people where they're at, not where you wish them to be, and by his grace you can walk each step of the way until they are back home in Christ, I find that to be more, more profound than anything else. And now we're, we're full circle. Because guess what it takes to walk with other people who are wandering? Guess what it takes? It takes patience and it takes prayer. So why are patience and prayer forever linked together? Well, because they are necessary ingredients for you to live a life of faith. And they are the identical ingredients for walking with those struggling to follow Jesus themselves. And finally, if we didn't tie this bow tighter, I don't know your life circumstance at all. But I know Jesus is doing two things right now, whether you are following him or not yet. I know he's doing two things. The number one thing Jesus is being towards you is remarkably patient. Why is there mercy every single morning available? Because we need it every single morning. That's his patience. And the second thing that the word tells me that Jesus is being for you right now is he is making intercession. He is praying for you. And so for you and I, if we want to be like Jesus, we need to grow in being patient with one another, but also prayerful with one another.